What's up, everybody? Welcome to Full Draw Friday, number 58. First of all, I didn't get to, I actually forgot to talk about the Deer and Beer Fest on the last intro that we did on the last episode. So I wanted to talk about that. The last Full Draw Friday you guys heard came to you from the Deer and Beer Fest this year. And it was a great time. It was the biggest it's been yet, just like we expected. There was a lot of people through there. Appreciate everybody that stopped by the booth to talk to us. We always enjoy getting to talk to people. And every year, more and more people telling us that they listen to the podcast and everything like that. It's awesome to see. We really appreciate you taking the time to stop by and chat. So we had a lot of fun at the show. Um, it was great getting to meet not only you guys, but also some of the other vendors there, some of the other people there. Um, it's always a good time. That show's really laid back. If you guys haven't checked it out, make sure to put it on the calendar for next year. I'm sure it's going to be just as good, probably even better. Uh, it's always a good time up there. So I wanted to hit on that before we got into this episode. Today, though, I'm going to be talking about some preseason tips. And this is actually from an article from the latest bow hunter magazine. And it's actually about elk hunting, or that's that's kind of the idea around uh, what the author is writing. But it applies, everything he talks about applies to deer hunting as well. So no matter what you're doing, whether you are going elk hunting or you're just getting ready for the whitetail season, you know, it's we're closing in on that time, so this stuff will apply to that. I'm not going to get too much into the meat of the article just because it is based around elk hunting, and I want to keep this open to because I know most of our listeners are going to be deer hunting. So I won't get into the article too much, but I do want to hit on the bullets that he went over because it's some stuff that we've talked about in the past and then a couple other things that are interesting maybe you haven't thought about. So let's get into that one, and then let's get into the weekend. All right, so the article I'm kind of stealing from is by Danny Ferris. It is called Shooting for Elk Season. We're just going to go with Shooting for Hunting Season because, again, this stuff is applicable no matter what you're going out to hunt, especially we're talking about bow hunting here. So we'll keep that in mind. I know a lot of seasons are going to be opened up here even in a couple weeks, ours in Illinois and some other ones, I think Iowa is October 1st. So you're looking at just over a month, really like a month till the season starts. So if you guys haven't been shooting, haven't been thinking about this stuff, now is definitely the time to start. You want to get this, get your practice in that way. When it comes down to you're at full draw on whatever animal you're looking to shoot, that's not when you're thinking about, man, I should have practiced or I hope this goes well, or I hope I make the shot. You got to know that that arrow is going to find where it's supposed to go. And if it doesn't, you know, things happen, but you have to let that be because of something that you couldn't control, right? Like maybe the deer jumped or you hit a branch or something that you didn't see. Don't let the arrow missing or hitting somewhere that you didn't want it to. Don't let that be because you didn't practice. So here's some things you guys can do. The first one is an interesting one that I hadn't really talked about before. But after reading this, and I got to thinking it back to... Nate's first buck last year and it makes a lot of sense it's practicing it holding it full draw so you don't think about that a lot when you're out shooting you just go through your reps right you draw back you settle in and you shoot and then you get your other arrow you draw back you settle in and you shoot however excuse me like I said if you think about Nate's buck last year that was on episode six I think of fall pursuit and I'm sure you guys have had experiences like this as well it doesn't always work out that way in the woods. You don't always just draw back, settle in, and shoot, right? You're usually drawing back based on where the deer is or what he's doing. So maybe he's behind a tree. Maybe he's coming up out of a creek. Something. He's probably moving. Maybe he just turned his head away, and you're drawing back. So a lot of times, if he is behind something, you're at full draw, and you have to wait for him to come out from behind the tree, the limb, take two more steps to get out of the weeds, something, right? So when that deer stops then you're stuck because you don't want to let down because there's a chance he's going to see that because that's usually a pretty dramatic movement, right? And they pick up on that kind of stuff, especially if they're in bow range. So if you don't have practice with being at full draw, not only do you need to get your muscles used to holding that and get them used to being at full draw for extended periods of time so when it comes down to do it, you're used to it and you're not getting tired, but also you need to be used to doing that and then making the shot, right? So it's not just about being able to hold the bow, the bow at full draw because eventually you are going to get tired and things are going to start to deteriorate as far as your, your hold goes and everything like that. So you need to make sure you're able to do that 
even when you've been holding it full draw for a minute, a minute and a half. Uh, the example I used, Nate's, was like 45 seconds last year. He drew back as the deer was going behind the tree. Another deer was coming in from the other direction. He saw it and just stopped dead in his tracks, and it was 45 seconds between the time that Nate got to full draw and released the arrow. So you're talking anywhere from that to, I mean, it could be over a minute, well over a minute, uh, if you don't if you don't want to let down, if you can't let down, right? Because that's kind of, once I get to full draw, once you get to full draw, you really don't want to let that thing down unless you just absolutely have to. So the longer you can hold it and be comfortable and confident that you can still make the shot, the better. So make sure when you're out there practicing at your targets, set a timer if you got to, or just don't set a timer, set a stopwatch. Draw back and hold as long as you can. And then when it starts to get real bad, you start burning, whatever, you start thinking, I, I don't know if I can make a shot. Go ahead and shoot. Stop the timer and see where you're at. And then that way you can kind of see where you're starting, get yourself a baseline. Maybe it was 35 seconds, right? And then you can build on that to try to get higher and higher. I would not suggest going out and doing that 50 times a day because you're just going to wear yourself out and you're going to create bad habits. But make sure that you are working it into your practice routine, going to full draw, holding it for an extended period of time, and then releasing that arrow. If you guys are looking for your own piece of ground to manage and hunt, Rodney Hawkins is a guy you need to talk to. He grew up hunting and fishing in Southern Illinois, and he's now putting that love for the outdoors into selling recreational properties as a land specialist with Midwest Farm and Land. Midwest Farm and Land isn't your average real estate company. They do residential properties, but they also do a ton of recreational property sales as well. Rodney himself sold over $7 million worth of properties last year alone. They've got agents like him all over Illinois, so they're really a local company with a national reach. For more info on them, what might be available, or even getting your property listed if you're looking to get rid of one and maybe get into something else, you can contact Rodney directly at 618-925-3153, and he'll get you taken care of. He's also got his own company called RG Outdoors that currently has products from Radix Hunting, Tech Cam Trail Cameras, Camo Dust, and he's adding new stuff all the time. So if you're interested in any of that, Go over to their Facebook page, RG Outdoors. Email them at rgoutdoors at yahoo.com. Or again, just call Rodney directly at 618-925-3153. The next one, practice from different positions. This is one that we talked about before. Now, obviously, in this article, he's talking about elk hunting. So you're on the ground most of the time. Uh, He's saying how you don't know when that elk's going to come in, how he's going to come in, where. Of course, you're in the mountains a lot of times, so you got uphill, downhill, things like that. It's similar in deer hunting, though. Even if you're in a stand, even if you're in a blind, think about shooting from a seated position. If you're on the ground, maybe shooting from a knee. If you're in a tree stand especially, that's a big one. You're going to have different shot angles depending on how close that deer is. So a lot of times people get messed up, I think, by turning the wrong way or pivoting at their arms and their shoulders instead of at their hips when they're shooting closer from up in a tree stand. So you got to practice all of that stuff. From the tree stand, you can squatting down. If you have shooting lanes where it's like a potential he could be there, and if you squat down, you can get the shot off. If not, he gets away. So why not be practice squatting down in your stand? Uh, practice seated from the stand also. Don't just think of that as something you do from a blind. Actually, if you set your stands up, if you can set your stand up, to where you can shoot sitting down in a preferred shooting lane. That's just that much less movement that you have to make when that deer is coming in. You don't have to worry about standing up. You can grab your bow, draw back, and shoot from a seated position. If you're confident, comfortable doing that, that's going to be way less movement, way less potential for him to see you as he's coming in. And you're still closer to the trunk of the tree. So the closest, as close as you can stay to that, the better your outline is going to be, the less chance you're going to have of being seen. So Obviously, it doesn't get much better than being set down with your back up against the tree. So think about that, all those different positions that you could shoot from. I'm not talking about like laying down on your back or anything goofy like that, but definitely seated position from the ground, from a bucket, from a blind chair, from one knee, from both knees, standing up in a stand, standing up on the ground, uphill, downhill, you know, close shots, far shots, shots from an elevated position, um, squatted, sitting in your stand, all that kind of stuff. Keep that in mind. Work that into your routine as well. And then you can combine those two. So the last two that I mentioned, practice holding at full draw and practice from different positions. Get in those positions, draw your bow back, and hold it and practice them together because you may be able to hold it for a minute and a half standing up, but now if you're squatted down and you're at full draw, now not only are your arms burning, but your legs are burning too. So practice that. The next one he mentions is practicing with your gear on. Another big one that I think gets missed a lot because we go out, and especially right now, it's 
it's hot. Like it's 90 something degrees outside. We're getting a cold, some colder weather moving in. So that's going to be great. But it makes it more difficult to worry about practicing like with your gloves on or even with a bino harness with, uh, uh, make sure you wear whatever you're wearing on your head, like your hat. If you have a face mask or something, you can throw it on and practice with it a couple times just to get used to it. But make sure you got the gear on that you're going to have when you're hunting. And I don't mean you got to have your big winter coat on, although if it gets cold enough, you want to practice with that. That's definitely a good thing to do. But like I said, if you're wearing a bino harness, uh, if you're going to wear a hat in the stand, wear a hat when you shoot. If you're going to wear gloves, wear gloves when you shoot. All of that stuff is going to make a little bit of difference just because the way you feel. And also you got potential stuff getting in the way. So you got to make sure your string's going to clear, your arrow's going to clear, your grip's not changing when you put gloves on. I fought that a couple years ago. Um, I'd put these thicker gloves on and shoot with those, and it was completely changing my grip. So I was not having consistent groups when I was shooting with gloves on. So I had to go in and practice with those over and over to figure out where my grip needed to be with my gloves on. So that's a big one. The next one is kind of encompassing of a few different things, and it goes back to the first one also, and that's raising your heart rate. So what he's talking about here, and in general when you hear people talking about this, when the, your target deer is coming in or your, the elk you're shooting or whatever it is, your heart rate's going to go up, right? That's why we do it. That's part of the reason that we enjoy the outdoors and hunting so much is because when that thing's coming in, your heart gets to pump and your adrenaline gets going, you get excited, right? That's part of the whole experience. When that happens, though, things change in your ability to shoot. So if you don't practice that way, you're not going to know how it feels until the last minute. And again, that's not when you want to be experiencing something for the first time. So elevate your heart rate in your training. And that can be doing push-ups, sit-ups, jumping jacks, a down and back. Like if you follow Cam Haynes, you see that guy, he runs to his target every time. Now his heart rate is not going to go up as easily as some other people's. And that's something I want to talk about here in a second. But... You can do that, run to get your arrows, run back. All that's going to elevate your heart rate. And you're going to notice that when your heart's beating, working harder, things are going to get a little more jumpy in your sight picture. You're going to have trouble holding your breathing. And settling that pin is going to become way more difficult. Your mind's not going to work quite as clearly because everything's worried about getting your heart rate back down. So you got to be able to fight through that stuff. Do that in your training so you don't have to worry about it when you get out there in the woods. The other way you can, can kind of work on your heart rate is to just be in better shape overall. And that goes to the first couple things we talked about as well. Holding your bow at full draw, being able to shoot from different positions, and then also your heart rate. So the better shape you're in, the lower your heart rate is going to be generally anyway, right? So if you think about it, the bigger you are, the more your heart has to work. The more out of shape you are, like your cardiovascular system, the more your heart has to work to compensate for all that. So it's naturally going to be at a higher rate anyway, and then when things get exciting, it's going to spike even more, right? Because it has to compete with everything else, just like it would someone who's in maybe a little bit better shape, but it's having to work harder for you if you're out of shape than it would have to if you just hit the gym a few times a week, go for a walk, do you know, go for a run, something like that. A lot of guys who would just whitetail hunt, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but we... What we do is we park in our spot and we walk maybe a couple hundred yards and we climb up a stand and we're set, right? So we don't think about being in physically decent shape as much as someone who's going to go out to the mountains and hunt elk or mule deer or mountain lions or whatever, right? Someone going out west to hunt is thinking a lot more about being in shape. And undoubtedly, they have to. Like, if you're not in shape out there, you're not going to have success because you're not going to be able to get to the places you need to get, even if you shoot something by some miracle, or even if you go rifle hunting and shoot something from a few hundred yards away, you still have to get that thing out of there. So unless you're spending tons and tons of money on a big outfit that's going to do all that stuff for you, you pretty much got to be in shape if you're going out there. You don't have to be in real good shape to whitetail hunt. And that's, in some ways, that's a good thing because it opens it up, I think, to a lot of people who maybe have issues where they can't get in shape or, or whatever that the case may be. But if you have the ability to, work out, get in the gym, it's just going to make things a lot easier. The walk-in, you're not going to sweat as much because you're not going to be as tired, so you're not going to be as cold. Your heart rate, again, going back to that, is not going to be naturally as high anyway, so you're going to be more calm. You're going to be able to settle a lot easier. Um, you're not going to be breathing nearly as hard if you're walking in walking out. Even when that deer's coming in, you're going to be able to control your breathing a lot better. 
because you're not ha- your body's not having to work as hard as it would if you're out of shape. And if you're at full draw, your muscles aren't going to get tired as fast, right? Because you're getting more oxygen to them. So they're not going to be depleted as early. So you're going to be able to hold that full draw longer. You're going to be able to hold it more solid for a longer period of time. You're going to be able to stay in that squatted position if that's where you have to be at full draw for a longer period of time. Maybe you're just standing up out of your stand to get ready to shoot and something sees you and now you got to stop. The better shape you're in, the longer you're going to be able to stay in that position and keep that deer from figuring out what you are. It may be that if you just stop, we've all done this, we've moved a little bit, the deer's seen it and he's kind of looked around or looked up at us and you don't move, you give it a minute or two and they just flick their tail and they go on about their business. That's the difference sometimes between killing one and not. So if you don't have the ability to do that, then you're setting yourself up for failure in the first place. So I'm not saying you got to be some triathlete, Olympic weightlifter, or anything like that. I'm definitely none of those things. I don't claim to be any of those things. I don't even claim to be in the best shape in the world. But I do think it's important that if you can get in shape, it's going to make your hunting experience better. And on top of that, it's going to make everything better, right? So it's just a good excuse if you need one, as if you need another one, to get in a little bit better shape. Maybe it's motivation uh, to start on that path of getting a little better shape. So keep that in mind also. He does hit on one more thing called uh, the magic pin. I don't think it's as applicable in whitetail hunting, but if you are going out to elk hunt, I will kind of cover this a little bit because it's an interesting thing that I hadn't really thought about. And he said he got this from the people he talked to that were giving him these tips, right? And he says as long as your bow is shooting arrows at 270 feet per second or faster, and most compound rigs these days are... Just forget about your 20 and 30 yard pins or about adjusting movable sight to any distance under 40 yards. From 40 yards and in, just hold your 40 yard pin on the bull's heart and take the shot. So when you're hunting elk, you can do that because your target's going to be a lot bigger, right? So out to 40 yards, just if you're inside of that, hold low. If you're at 40, hold right on and then you can just out past there and that's going to take away a lot of the thinking. The thing I will say that how that kind of relates to deer hunting is if you find a good balance between speed and a heavy arrow setup, the flatter you shoot, the less adjustment you're going to have to worry about. I think my pin, I usually set it at 25 yards, and I can shoot it 20 dead on and 30 dead on. It's maybe an inch or two low at 30 yards if I'm holding dead on. So I feel like that's a pretty good sweet spot. Most of my shots are 30 yards and in, so I can set that pin, and I don't really have to worry about moving it. Now, if I get in a situation where it is 35, 40 yards, and I need to take that shot, then I can do that. But if you can get your setup dialed in to where it's shooting pretty flat find that good balance then that's kind of one of the advantages to not going really really heavy and you can still have a good a good solid setup without sacrificing that also for just speed you can find a balance in there where you're looking at 25 30 yards where you can set your pin and leave it and basically shoot all the way in and out to that distance so those are some tips for you guys to get ready for the upcoming season hopefully that helps maybe it's some stuff you have thought about you just forgot about haven't been working on maybe also some things that you hadn't thought about before i know a couple of those i hadn't really given a lot of thought to so i hope it helps i'm looking forward to getting into the season we got like i said a month left here in illinois so get out there get practiced up shoot your bow and be ready when the time comes so we'll see you on the next one guys